Good, good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. And tonight we have a fellow Toastmaster friend of mine by the name of Bonnie Jean who's gonna present the American political identity. But anyway, the college consists of the following format. First, we have a brief announcements period. Then we have our speaker, Bonnie Gina, will speak up to an hour. Then we have our uh, rebuttal, I mean, our question and answer period, followed by our rebuttal period. There's two rules to the college, one fool at a time, and no personal attacks. That means they can't call Charlie a schmuck. Huh. But uh, I know he uh, will be calling me a schmuck at some point tonight, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, generally, we try to finish off about 9 p.m., but I'll keep the Zoom call open since we're not under uh, the constraints of the restaurant right now. And Charlie, if you want to get started with the announcements, uh, we can now uh, get the, uh, I'll start, start sharing my screen and uh, put everything up. So go ahead and. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much. And welcome to meeting number 3,625. So the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Uh, first of all, if you go to our website right at the top, you'll see a link to the notes or handout that were given on our last week's program by Karina uh, regarding how to live economically free, three things in the city. She's got about four pages there. So that link is right at the top of the page, and also you repeat it again at the bottom. Okay, uh, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On July 24th, uh, the author will speak on his book on the secrets of Jesus and his inner circle. He's confirmed speaking, so... Uh, we're going to be talking about theology on the 24th and in going in search of the historical Jesus. On July 31st, we're going to have two organizations on the issue. This is in the news right now regarding voting protection and rights. Uh, one of the groups is Swing Left, a nationwide organization which has a 10-year plan, as a matter of fact. So that's on July 31st. On August the 7th, Actually, they're going to be from overseas, but the young world federalists who want to see one nation state governing the world uh, will be uh, at the college on August the 7th. Now, we've got, next, after that, we have three open dates, August 14, 21, and 28. And I'm having a little difficulty filling these in. So if anybody knows of someone to speak or would like to speak with themselves, speak themselves, uh, I would certainly appreciate it. That's August 14, 21, and 28. Now, I will take, I'm almost certain to take one of those dates myself. I finished a, a presentation in which I look back in history, going back to the beginning of time, and I look at the life of the ordinary person. What was the lifestyle of the ordinary person, and how has it changed over time? So I found that to, I found some interesting things. I'm not going to be in too much in the statistics, but okay, we've got three open dates in August. On September the 4th, we're going to have our special Labor Day speaker, uh, Mark Burroughs. I've spoken to the college before. And he's the principal officer of the Railway Workers Union. He's going to talk about the accomplishments of the organized labor movement in the United States. That's on September the 4th. On September the 11th, Jim Feitzer, oh, good. who was the founder of the academic 9-11 uh, truthers, uh, will be returning to the college on September the 11th to talk about the uh, 9-11 truth or fiction, um, or reality. So that's on September the 11th. On September the 18th, a nationwide organization called Green America will be having one of their executive officers, 
And they put out a magazine, if you're not aware of it. So one of the editors of Green America, which was originally Co-op America. So uh, it's an interesting organization on September the 18th. On September the 25th, uh, an author will be returning uh, talking about a new book in which he toured the United States uh, during the, the height of the pandemic. And he will recount the discussions he had when inter- interviews with people around the country. Anyhow, that's about it. And hope to see you. Thank you very much, Tim. All right, uh, Bonnie, the floor is yours. We have uh, Ellen, I'm glad you could come in. And Bob, I'm glad you could come in today. Uh, Bonnie, uh, if you're ready, take it away. And uh, <laughs> the floor is yours. Well, it is actually Bonnie Jean. And Bonnie as- Jean, yes, I forgot you told me at the beginning. <laughs> and as an identity person who's going to talk about identity, that's really important. Um, so thank you for that, because that opens up the door to thinking about how we have an ethical dilemma, dilemma regarding the downfall of American political identity. So now I uh, would like to delve right into that. You know, I, I gave the title Picking the Better of Two Evils because sometimes that's what it feels like in our political economy and our political realm. And I wanted to start with first kind of defining what this, what evil is, maybe, because it's not always straightforward. Sometimes we think of evil as being this horrible thing like the witches of Eastwick coming out at us, casting spells and doing, you know, the devil's work, so to speak. But what is evil really? Evil is doing bad in the world, not allowing for good works. And it doesn't mean that somebody is or a group is not necessarily doing some good. I mean, if you look at the two parties in America, we have the Democrats and the Republicans, right? We have these two sides to the coin. They both do good, but they also both do bad. But where does that history come from? Because I can imagine that in 1776 or so, when they, our forefathers were sitting around making decisions for the future and trying to create change and end the tyranny of the British rule, they were not thinking about having two political parties and always having just two choices. If you think back to the, or if you know of your history and can recall learning about the first presidential election in 1781, it wasn't just George Washington and one other person and they ran against each other. There was a whole slew of people running. And then whoever came in first, George Washington, and whoever came in second, I don't remember who the vice president was, but that's because we're not supposed to remember the vice presidents was a different party potentially, they became the vice president. And what was really good about that is you had bipartisan politics. Even if you had disagreements, you had people from different walks of life, different mentalities politically challenging each other. So no power was in the hands of one group, which was nice. However, uh, several years later, we end up having a rule put on the books that we had to go through this whole primary system and then you had to, voters had to declare a party and it takes away from the American identity aspect. As Americans, we have a rooted history. As Americans, we come from both good and bad or good and evil as the case may be, you know, rooted in aspects of enslavement, of taking land that wasn't ours, so to speak. But we also have good things, wonderful inventions and the Star Spangled Banner. And and we've given aid to countries all over the world to create things that are better. Again, two sides to the coin. But having a two-party system that is so married in rigidity that prevents anyone from outside from having even a voice on the table or at the, you know, the debates right before the elections is problematic. In my lifetime watching elections, there's only been twice that an independent of some kind 
was on, was got a seat at the table for the debates. One was Ralph Nader. Do we remember Ralph Nader from ages hence? He had lots of money. He put lots and lots of money in and he ran for president at least three or four times before he was invited to the table. And there's a little known, unknown rule that you have to get as a, as a third party 8% of the vote in order to have a seat at the debate table. He actually did not get that in the previous election, but because he'd run so often and he used his monetary um, clout, so to speak, he got a seat at the table. The other independent that got a seat at the table in a debate was Bernie Sanders. Oh, wait, he changed his party officially to Democrats so that he would have a seat at the table because he recognized that there had to be a workaround in the system. So by changing his party, he still was an independent in practice, but in name and on paper, he put himself in the running in a different way. That's not necessarily all bad, but when you only have the two parties, you're left with the better of two evils. I think back to the election between Hillary Clinton and Obama. Now Obama actually turned out, in my opinion, to be a very good president. But then after Obama, we had somebody running against Trump who I don't even remember, was that Hillary who was on the ballot against Trump? Please remind me, blur of the last several years. Uh, but I'm not a personally a Hillary Clinton fan. I think she would have been a horrible president and a horrible option for our country. I also think Donald Trump was a horrible option for our country. I was faced with this horrible decision and my union was pushing Hillary Clinton down our throat. Yes, I like that that face, Bob. That that just ah, that's what I felt like at that election time because my union, my friends were all trying to push me to vote for Hillary and the only thing that Hillary had going for her supported education. That's the only thing. In Illinois, the decision was already made so I could go and vote my conscience and vote for a third party, which I did. But what did that leave us with as a country? We had Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. The, the, wait, how long was Trump president? Four years that Trump was president? Felt like a lot longer, so I can't remember. <laughs> there was some good that happened in that, but there was a lot of not so good that happened in there. Would it have been better under Hillary's regime? I don't know. Come fast forward to the last election, we were in a similar position. We had Trump and we had, who's our president? Oh, Biden, Biden's our president. Again, the only thing he has going for him is the fact that he supports education and Trump didn't. That's the only thing in my estimation. Now, being forced to choose between two people that are not the best for the country is not conducive to freedom, because that's what we as Americans were promised in our constitution, the freedom to have liberty, to pursue happiness, to be able to thrive in our identities and our identity as American citizens, to be leaders amongst the world. And yet I am very profoundly aware of the reality that we actually have something more like this happening. I'm going to share my screen. We have this idea where we're supposed to be trying to compromise between the parties, the left side, the right side, and try to find some area of agreement, but the road is rocky. And we've locked ourselves into a place where we aren't open to change and growth. And that middle ground ends up being ethically unstable or literally unstable as this cartoon that I found in indicates. And, you know, evil is a, it's a hotbed word, 
But when you think about it, if we had a landscape where we have the ability to have a whole lot of voices come out onto the table and a whole lot of different messages and really think about what's good for the people of the nation, where might we be? That's a bit speculative, I know, and as a sociology instructor for 20 years now, is being speculative is not always the best, but at the same time, think about current hotbed issues. Right now, we're looking to, or some are looking to raise the minimum wage to $15. That's more than double or nearly double what it currently is right now. So if it's nearly double, that would be a huge help to a lot of people who are in occupations and in careers who should be making more at their entry level. I'm not denying that. However, as I was talking to a friend recently, they failed to realize that it's really a Band-Aid solution. It only solves a part of the problem of the economy in America. And looking at it in one lens, straightforward, as one side of the coin, it's a good thing to have more money. But what will happen is companies will lower their workforce because now they have to high, pay twice as much money to their entry-level persons. Small businesses will get attacked and end up failing. Businesses like my own where I pay $10 an hour, which is above the minimum wage to my entry-level and then I work it, uh, work it up uh, as I can, depending on what clients pay we will get shuffled out of the mix because we can't afford to actually have employees. And then prices of goods will eventually go up. When we've had the minimum wage go up in the past, if you look at trends, it's about one to three years, depending on the location for a rise in goods and cost of living. And then we're back at the same place. So it's a Band-Aid for a couple of years. It doesn't heal the problems of our economy that have been created by this two-party system, like by this two-party choice, by this two, the better of two evils. Is it better to leave our minimum wage where it is or is it better to raise it? If we raise it and don't fix all the other things, that is a problem. As just as much as if we leave it where it is and not fix all the problems. We have to fix more than just what we see. And I don't wanna to go too far into the you know, minimum wage debate, but it's a perfect example of how picking the better of two evils plays out in real life in applied practice with real people being affected. No matter what topic we're thinking of, no matter what subject matter we're thinking of, when, we when it comes right down to it, if you're forced to pick the better of two evils, you're stuck in the middle with pretty much nothing. Or as I like to quote people that aren't me, Aaron Russo, he tells us the two party system is a bad joke on the American people. When it comes to Republicans and Democrats, remember they are two sides of the same coin. Voting for the lesser of two evils is still a vote for evil and not an answer to our problems. A vote for a Republican or a Democrat will not fix anything and is a wasted vote. He says it's a wasted vote. I still say that your vote matters, but interestingly enough, sometimes it feels like when we're voting between these two choices, that it's a lot like this. If anyone is familiar with Freud and his theory of the id and the superego, Freud talks about how we have this desire to do certain things. And when I teach it in my class, I talk about that as being a little devil speaking in your ear like the cartoons of old. And the superego is that part of you, that consciousness that's trying to tell you to do right. But when we think about our party system, it's like we have two ids talking in both our ears. And often the powers that be, the politicians that are vying for the power and your vote are 
making decisions like this. They're letting themselves be bought for the gain of themselves as much as the perceived gain of the people. Now, I know it's a TV show, but I, have, I was watching the television show Leverage. I was just introduced to it recently. And one of the cons that they have decided to play is trying to convince a commission in Congress to vote to make cheerleading a sport. And the commentary of this episode was very clear cut that in order to get anything done that was good for the people, they had to do back door dealings, back room dealings, offer this, bribe per this person. And good people end up having to do bad things to do good things. But if you're doing the wrong things or not ethical things to get to a good result, is that good result still good? I wonder if it is. I question that. You know, integrity is this idea of being able to do the right thing even when no one else is looking. And defining the right thing maybe is the difficult aspect. But ethically speaking, doing no harm to other people is the most important aspect, or at least some of our philosophers of days of old would tell us. Doing harm versus not doing harm. Emotional harm, physical harm, financial harm, there are all sorts of harms that are out there. And that's why the question between Trump versus Biden, Biden versus Trump, becomes an ethical question of the better of two evils. Now, I know some are staunch all for one side and, and others are staunch all for another. But when you look realistically and really at the questions at hand and at the people at the center of the mix, and those who control these two parties that are problematic in controlling everything, it makes me wonder what would be different if they were opposite? Oh, wait, they were. Actually, the Republican Party used to be the Democratic Party and the Democratic Party didn't even exist back when our renowned president, Abraham Lincoln, took office, he was a Republican. I remember when I learned that Lincoln was a Republican, I said, no way, he freed the slaves. Well, technically, that was a byproduct of a war and a battle that was about economics and about federal control and not, or a fight against federal control and not specifically about the ownership of people or the false ownership of people as the case may be. But it was an opportunity for him to step up and for him to create a massive change both in the economy and in the goodwill towards people who lived in this nation. What was interesting though is the Republican party at that time looked more like the Democratic party, the Democrat party of today. It looked more in terms of being more liberal, more of the type of people that challenge the system or fight for change and growth and were less conservative. Somehow it switched over the next couple of years and we developed the Democrat party. When you think of the term Republican, it stems from this idea of being for the Republic, right? That's what the root of Republic and actually represents. Being for the Republic and for the people. And that's why it was more of a liberal aspect. But you bring the Democrats in and that's supposed to be a party that's for the people of the people. That's at least what it was founded in. And this idea of transitioning out of being a Republican into it being named the Democrats and it's this idea that the democratic process is focused on. When someone explained it to me that way a few years ago, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. And ultimately the Republic becomes more about the control of the government and more conservative knowledge and the like, rather than the Republic of people who were fighting against the tyranny of the past. Today's tyranny, what does it look like? 
it was easy to see tyranny of a king forcing taxes on people from across the pond or an ocean as the case really is. It's easy in hindsight looking back and seeing the overtaxation and the, the control and the different measures. But if we take a step back and look at what our world is in America now, I wonder if some of the practices of tyranny of the past aren't repeating themselves in the modern era and being forced into a system that challenges our ethical choice in choosing our consciousness for who we want to vote for. I know people and students who tell me, why bother voting? It's already decided. I mean, even I said that I, since I live in Illinois and it's already determined who's going to win, I could vote my conscience and vote a third party because it really wouldn't matter anyway. How demeaning is that for an American people who should be proud of their heritage, even with evidence and practices that have happened in our American past that weren't all perfect and happy-go-lucky. Humanity isn't perfect. The better of two evils is an example of why we're not perfect and how we're not perfect. But if we start questioning, or I should say when we start questioning the system and putting pressure to create change and allow our voices as American citizens to be heard first and foremost, maybe that increase in minimum wage will snowball into a balancing out of the economy in such a way that we don't also raise the price of potatoes or raise the price of rice or whatever we end up raising the price of by making that important aspect to help people out of poverty. Sometimes I wonder if this is really a question of the rich versus the poor. And I think about that in terms of who's historically been Democrat and who's historically been Republican. It tends to be one group is made up of those who are at the higher economic status and one is made up of folks at the lower economic status. But that's no longer true. When you look at statistics now in our modern world, it's not quite as cut and dry. It's not quite as cut and dry that you have you know, a predominant of one race in one, one political party and a predominant of race in another. And it's not even true any longer about age. The demographics of the political parties are shifting. And I wonder and I hope that maybe we are seeing a process happening that we might just happen to get to a place where we will end this idea of you only can be part of these two parties. We have for 30 or so years have very practicing and active other parties in the Green Party and the, the Libertarian Party, and then some others that come and go as they see. But the Green Party specifically has been on the playing field for my entire life. I'm not sharing my age, though. Don't ask. <laughs> no, I don't care. You can know it. <laughs> Fact is, there are problems with the system. There are problems even getting up to the position of being where we have two people for the presidential candidacies that are neither right for, the gov for our leadership in this country. The primary system is completely broken. The ability to bribe our way up or have, you know, backdoor deals and, oh, I'll give your campaign this money if you just make sure to vote for this when you get into office. It spits in the face of the Constitution that it was set up in a way to prevent all of this. The whole point of the Constitution as it was written was to protect the people, protect the process, and to ensure that with a try checks and balance system, we are able to pass laws, have an administrative branch and have a legal branch check each other out and make sure that no one person, no one party, no one group has tyrannical power. 
then the question begs, how do we define tyranny? Some would have argued back in the 1770s that England wasn't being tyrannical. They were just leading. They were exerting their rightful power as the leader of the colonies. Were they? Were they not? Part of a power structure is okay, or how much power should a government hold over its people? Whether we're talking federal, state, local, how much power do our leaders deserve to have over a nation that's supposed to be of the people, by the people, for the people? How is it of the people, for the people, or by the people, for the people, if the people's voice is truncated to only two choices and only ever two choices? This is the downfall of the American political identity. And eventually it will be the downfall of the American identity as a whole. We as Americans, shouldn't be forced into a situation exemplified by this picture. Oh. I have one more picture for you. This idea of the choosing the lesser of two evils and then it asks how is choosing evil working out for you? And there's this battle between the GOP and the Democrats. This is not a battle that's new. This is not something that suddenly appeared on our doorsteps yesterday or two years ago or four years ago. This battle for party control stems back 200 years. But now is a time of change and growth and we can take back that power for the people if we want to. Question is how? And that, of course, I'm left with a million thoughts on how that can happen. <laughs> and maybe that would be a good project for my students one day to think about how we can fix the problems with our nation. But it all starts and is rooted and should be rooted in the Constitution. I am very much, without question, a constitutionalist. This document was created to be a living, breathing document and change with the times. And yet for some reason, we are often afraid to allow it to change with the times. Why build into a system process to change the, do the governing document if you're not going to use it from time to time? Yes, it has been used. Yes, we've added amendments that have changed laws. Yes, we've even changed the Big Ten, the Bill of Rights, slightly. Still question the validity of, for instance, the Second Amendment. One party says we need regulation, the other party says we don't. Technically, the Constitution does call for no interference of gun ownership. But our lovely forefathers did not count for automatic weapons and it being so readily available and the gun violence being that it was, or lo and behold, people bringing guns into our schools and killing children. Had they envisioned that, would they have written it the way they did? But they wrote into the constitution a means for it to be changed if we, the people, want it to be changed. It's not whether I'm for or against guns or for or against regulation. It's recognizing that when we have a two-party system that's locked in as a two-party system, that the battle becomes them versus us, us versus them, back and forth, and we miss the good we can do. We miss the power that we as people have instead of the power of the collective nation. 
the only way to return to an ethical place is to think about, even though they weren't perfect human beings, the forefathers that we do have were trying to see a better future. And they made it very clear right in the preamble that we are evolving and we are changing. Maybe it's time that we stop looking for the better of two evils and start trying to find no evil and put good back into our government. I know that's a place I want to live, a place where goodness and kindness and choice allow my identity to flourish as me instead of as somebody on higher up dictates to me. On that note, are there any questions? Okay, Charlie, I had to mute you during the presentation because you were interfering at star six to unmute your phone. So, you know, my apologies, but uh, you can unmute. You've got to just go to star six on your phone to unmute. And uh, you should be all set otherwise. Okay, good. You're back. All right. Now all right. I'll, I'll start off with a question, uh, Tim. All right, Bob. Yeah. So uh, in uh, in 1920, uh, Teddy Roosevelt ran as a as a bull moose, and he uh, he got uh, you know more votes than uh, than I think it was Taft. Woodrow Wilson won, but. But the, uh, the you know, Woodrow Wilson got like 48% of the vote or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, Teddy Roosevelt got like 27. And then the other guy, I think it was Taft, got like 23 or 24. So, I mean, a third party can edge out one of the other. It is one of, it, it, it has happened that one time. Yes, <laughs> you are correct. At least at the federal level and local yeah. level. But however, it, it just, it just split the, Basically, it was just splitting the Republican vote, and then the Democratic vote won. So that's really generally what happens when you have a, a third party. I think is you're just, you know, you're, you're just splitting. If you have the Greens come in and do well, well, the Greens are just splitting the Democratic vote, just like the Libertarians are just splitting the Republican vote. I, to some degree, you are absolutely correct, Bob. Um, but you know what happened with back with Teddy Roosevelt that party ended up be merging in and it was kind of, they saw it more as like a fluke of the time period and this demand huge demand for change and if we have that kind of huge demand for change again maybe we will see a third party step up and create you know a rift in the two party system again but you know a lot of the uh, republicans are not happy with what the, you know what the way the republican party is being run but the but it, we, you know, what we have to do is we just have to we have to figure uh, that you know we'll get in and we'll you know we'll make you know we'll try to make it better, you know. Uh, so that's you know, you know that's that's that that might be you know the way to, the way to work it. But uh, and now there's I, I didn't hear you I didn't hear you talk at all about uh, uh, the instant runoff voting and stuff like that. Maybe. I don't know if that's a solution that you would consider, uh, uh, but I, you know, I'd maybe like to hear you address some of that stuff too. I, I'm not sure what you mean about instant runoff voting. Like, well, I think that's when multiple candidates run, and then they, then they have like a. I think uh, someone else can probably explain it better than I can. I think uh, uh, the votes uh, are somehow allocated you to. To the, to the losers. Wait, can somebody else explain that better than I can? How that instant runoff voting runs uh, works? Are you, you're talk, you're to, uh, I know what you're talking about, Bob, but I'm forgetting what it's talking about now. Yeah, maybe somebody else can explain it better better than I can. But it's but it's where you have multiple. You know, you can have multiple people run, and so it's not a, a situation where uh, you, you know where somebody that gets just, you know, like if you have like somebody that gets 13% of the vote, they end up winning because the other parties, you know, split the rest of it up. You, you have like a little minority. 
the way you're talking about is when you like in the old days when George Washington ran, everybody ran first in place got the presidency and the vice presidency, but there wasn't that large of a population and it wasn't like more than a handful. It's not good for your eyes. Why? Move computer for. It wasn't like a handful of people were running. Um, but yes, you can put limits in place that say you must have at least X, Y, Z of the votes or you have to have a runoff of the top three or top four or something like that. Um, right. I, think, I, think that's what, I think that's what it does. Yeah. I think when you have a big field, yeah, then you have a, another election or something of the, of the, yeah, the top so many or something like right. that. Yeah, because Bob, there are limits. Bob, can I explain it? Yeah, go ahead. It's it's to avoid the ballot access issue and that's the problem right now and it's a big issue with the green party ballot access rank choice voting is a way of there they say you have to have insurmountable number of signatures in order merely to compete in the primary process and it changes the primary process so that you eliminate that criteria that obligation and the voters then rank uh, among all the candidates who are winning so to speak the top two so forth yeah yeah so so basically it's it's also putting in um, a limit that you have to have to be the actual final winner you have to have a certain percentage of the vote in order to win. And so if you only have 13%, that's not whatever the threshold is. Um, if you have if you have a clear cut 35% and the threshold is 30, then you're good to go and you don't need a runoff. But, um, and you would have a runoff of, of whatever it spells out in the document, the ruling documentation for it. So New York City just had ranked voting. And so the first, one Eric Adams won, and uh, so they had ranked voting. I, I'm not sure why, but anyway. Okay. On our program coming up, uh, I even was contacted by the Greens because the Voting Reform Act did not include ranked choice voting, and the Greens were upset about that. Uh, the People Act, and the, that's somewhat the issue here um, right now. There's a lot of debate about that, and the and Greens are upset that the People Act did not include this new methodology. I'm not as up to speed with it as I probably should be, <laughs> um, but you know, my thought is everyone should have a voice period um and that voice is how you get change and, and actually it's going to asher's question in the chat i struggle with an issue neither right nor left what is the entry point then to get a serious change affected and change starts with speaking out you know saying you want to have a voice um getting it to getting things to committee allowing things to have a discussion and talking through the problems and trying to find solutions. Um, so it, it, and it's not always easy. You know, we're like in the, for contingent faculty at the community, at community colleges and uh, four-year colleges, historically speaking, they are paid less than a fourth of what their full-time counterparts are for the same work. And yet colleges and universities don't want to pay them more. How do you change that? How do you speak out about that? And you know, it's one contract at a time, one you know discussion at a time, one podcast at a time, one step at a time. And whether we're talking about fixing the economy for having you know equal pay and an equalized equity pay, so people aren't everybody's not in poverty, or trying to fix a two system or something along those lines, we start with talking about it. We start small solutions, and it's not an overnight change. We're not ever, I mean, unless we have a revolutionary change like a war, which I don't really want that for any of us ever again, 
uh, we're we're not going to likely have a revolutionary change unless you know something like death is involved, and that and I don't want that for anyone. Does that answer your question, Asher? Sort of. I I've contacted everyone from my city council to the president, but. Uh, the CDC refuses to acknowledge my disease is real. And it's frustrating because if I'm not right or left, like the the news doesn't want to talk about it. Nobody wants to talk about it. Yeah, and, and that's part of the problem when you have a system that's set up to only focus on the two parts. And yes, we might have some votes taken away from Democrats or Republicans and split some votes. But when we keep doing a system that locks people out, then I, I don't know your full circumstances. We end up having a situation where nobody will want to listen to somebody because they don't fit on into the box that have been checked. Any other I'll questions? ask a question. Um, hi. <laughs> yeah, hi. Um, I, I liked your talk and I agree, you know, with the concerns. I think to me, the problem is fascism, <laughs> that there's a deep state kind of above us. And um, I've read, you know, talks where they say, you know, people go, oh, we have two different parties. So, you know, that means it's not just one powerful dictatorship control and things, but uh, I think, but he points out that, you know, since there's two of them, they really kind of act as one. So what do you think about fascism? Have you done any research into that or? Um, yeah, I actually have spent a lot of time studying, you know, different aspects of fascism, you know, perceived fascism, communism, Nazism, all those different aspects. And, you know, power is, Power is a goal that people strive for. Karl Marx tells us that everyone wants to have power and the people who are oppressed, and this is also goes back to Pelle Fourier who talks about the pedagogy of the oppressed. So between those two theorists, when somebody is oppressed in some way or another, whether it's simple, complex, minuscule, or my, seemingly minor or major oppression, eventually there will be an overturn and the oppressed will become the oppressors and it's always a constant cycle and according to marx specifically you know there are classes and these classes create the struggle that ultimately wants certain people to be at the top with power and by to keep their power they do whatever is necessary and so that is where you get fascist practices or um practices that are meant to control even when there shouldn't be control uh, and social control and literal control, uh, things that take away the right of the people to make decisions for themselves and put all the power back in the hands of the government. And that's where there's some confusion about what communism really is because people don't always understand what totalitarian socialism means and the positives and negatives, and if you go back and look at it from a theoretical perspective versus practice. But the crust of it all, the, the, the really key point is that people in power want to keep their power and they will use whatever means they have in their hands, literal or figuratively, to keep that power. They'll pass laws, they'll use weapons, they'll you know, control things. And this is where we get, you know, to go off topic a bit. This is where you get conspiracy theories and all sorts of crazy stuff or not so crazy stuff happening uh, to explain why the rich stay rich and the poor stay poor. And, you know, even the last 16 months is a great exemplifier of how, you know, something can happen and the poor, those in poverty, those on the bottom end of the middle class get into positions of, des of being destitute and the wealthy become so much more wealthy that that gap becomes even larger 
between them and it's all really about power and and i agree to some degree to to some degree that you know these two political parties behind closed doors are probably doing handshake deals to make sure that the power stays within the higher economic status as opposed to the political parties and it's you know i've long since believed there's some sort of um fallacy or a shield or something bigger happening behind the scenes and i'm i'm still i haven't put my finger on it yet i'm i'm still watching and observing and and waiting for the evidence to come to light <laughs> so yeah Ellen, that's, that's a good point did i did i go too far off tangent or did, oh, I, did I good answer you're right i'm uh i'm trying to put my finger on that too and it <laughs> one issue that maybe you could talk about is censorship and you know the one thing i'm concerns me lately is that i see I'm a real skeptic about the vaccine as being kind of a fascist, you know, uh, campaign and um, for power, I like your definition and, but yet you can't say anything and um, on the radio and it, but it, if you think it, it's like makes you a right winger, you know, <laughs> because uh, it's so strange. I mean, the way that it's separating, uh, you know, into different groups, uh, warring factions. And um, it's, it's interesting, fascism and censorship and the spiral of um, silence, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, that what, that's what worries me, you know, I, maybe why you teach sociology, um, <laughs> but how to, how to get us, you know, to, um, I mean, you know, how to get people to talk about fascism, it, it feels kind of taboo. And, also the use of the word conspiracy theory. I'd be interested in what you think is a conspiracy theory um, regarding fascism, because I hate being called a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> Quite a few questions in that. Um, fact and point, in addition to studying identity, I also study mass trauma events and, um, and things like the Holocaust, the Spanish flu, um, 9-11, different aspects. And I also study the media's role in them, both, you know, fiction and nonfiction aspects of it. So, so you're, you're talking about that as a very uh, profound idea to, to think about because I've been watching the last year and a half and I started out with speaking out with some of the things I was seeing, but I then stepped back and just kept watching because Right now, we're still in this state where we're creating a whole nother class of discriminatory groups. You know, the vaccine versus the non-vaccinated. You know, it's it's you know we've we've been discriminatory based on if you're one race or another, if you're one gender or another, if you're you know LGBT, you know you're gay or straight or you're rich or poor. But now we have this medical reason for vaccination. It's sort of like returning back to like the idea of leper colonies type of thing. And um, in my mind, you know, it seems to be a bit larger for something with or disease that has less than a 2% comorbidity rate. Um, when there have been over the last 30 years, diseases that have hit the stage that have had 30, 40, 100% morbidity, not comorbidity, but morbidity. So from a political standpoint, this is an interesting thing to study. And while we're in it, it's really hard to look at it. But this is also the first time in history when a something hit the world in a way that everywhere in the world we can see what's happening because we have social media and the like. And I see how the media is controlled by one entity. Actually, it's, it's said that five organizations own all of the media for the most part. There are a couple of independent things out there, but not very many. And it is a conglomerate. And there's a lot of control over what ends up being presented in the media, presented in the news. And a lot of it tends to be one-sided. This is reminiscent of past periods of history where you did end up with fascist regimes in places. And I myself have actually, if I bring up some of those fascist regimes, I'm told I'm all, all sorts of names. And, and my thing is, 
I look at it from both sides because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a researcher. I study it. I want to understand from this side, this side, this side, this side, this side. And if we don't understand the whole, we're going to end up repeating the past mistakes that we've had in the world or locally or globally, whatever. As to conspiracy versus non-conspiracy, um, conspiracy theories are things that are more hypothesis. There's no rooted facts for them. They are theories and they are perfectly valid to have because you are, as long as you have reason for the, the theoretical hypothesis, they, there's, until you have something that can prove or disprove them beyond a reasonable doubt, then you're just hypothesizing and so maybe we should stop calling them conspiracy theories, but alternate hypotheses. And I like the language of alternate hypotheses because it allows for the voice of the people to express their opinion in a land where we're supposed to have free speech. But when we express alternative hypotheses, then we end up being ostracized. Uh, Bonnie Jean? Yes, yes. Tim, can I? Yes, yeah, that's question. fine, Charlie. Go ahead. All right. Um, many years ago, I was involved in organizing the employees of coffee shops uh, to increase the minimum wage. Uh, we'd go to each of them, and, and when they asked, what did you want? We'd say, we'd want you to have an increase in pay. And um, even Starbucks got it scared. They sent managers from around the country in the Chicago to to kill the movement but they weren't successful now you said never raise wages because it will be harmful to the business and and it'll be harmful to the economy is this what I now the employees call mansion for advice is that what I should have told them don't don't bother wanting an increase and in, i mean i'm i'm having i often speak to the machinists and which i'm affiliated with and if i told the guy boys we don't want to increase in wage because as you said we'll be in two or three years we'll be right back where we were i I, I, I don't know if that's a tenable position i didn't say never raise the rages i said that if you go in to just raise the rages and put just raise wages without having a solution to the other problems, we will be back where we're at or again in just a few years because history continues to show that. But if you raise wages while also fixing other aspects of the economics, the economy that we live in that doesn't harm people, then we then the higher wages will be good. And just and jumping doubling it is problematic. Like I, you know, in, in bargaining for new contracts and things, you don't go in asking for twice the amount you're making. You know, that it seems to be going in and going from, what is it now, 825 to 50. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have spent 35 years writing union contracts and I even wrote a book on this. I'm not aware of any such criteria. What do you, I mean, you going in, 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 in writing a proposal for a contract. Right. But it's governed by the circumstances. Well, of course it is determined by the circumstances and the different scenarios. And there are cases in point that are outliers, but generally speaking, you're not likely to get double what you're currently making when you go in for bargaining for a new contract. Just that's how bargaining works. Even if you ask for double, you'll end up negotiating and coming to a point that's lower. Does that make sense, Charlie? Well, we have evidence that the people in in the nation just got a doubling increase in locations and also, if we're based on evidence, you, you said there's harmful effects, and there were studies done in areas, locations where it was raised, New York in particular, and San Francisco, the West Coast, the East Coast, and there were no de deleterious effects. 
initially, no, it takes sometimes a couple years for those to happen. And you end up, that's why I said two, three, four years out, not just immediate. But I suspect that if you have a raise going from 825 to 15, you'll end up having greater effect a lot sooner based on the different eco you know, economic trends that I've seen. And I lived in California when they raised the, uh, uh, the uh, minimum wage and there were ill effects in Southern California when they raised the minimum wage within six months. So um, it, 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 there were grave problems that happened because of that massive jump, something like 25 years ago. So um, it, it, it's not a all or nothing. I've not said that the, none, any of this is not absolute. I, there are trends and outliers and circumstances and context. You know, C. Wright Mills tells us that we have to understand the social location, the when and where plays a, diff, plays a role in how it is. So I'm glad that you've had some union contracts written that have gotten bigger raises. That's wonderful. I'd love to have see, see some of that information on it because I think that would be really great and helpful to some other unions to know how they can use those same arguments to get bigger raises. That would be great. Okay, uh, who's next? Go ahead, Vicki. Okay. Um, I really enjoyed listening to your talk, whether it's Toastmasters or Natural Talent or a combination, you're very easy on the ears and intriguing to the mind. In the two, 2016 election, which I wish I could get beyond, one of my friends I consider to be liberal said he would hold his nose and vote for Hillary. And when I tried to find out what he meant by that, he said she just wasn't likable. And I, I'm not sure I care about that. Uh, can you tell me more about what you think she would have done or not done that would have been so terrible? And again, I would have preferred the lesser of two evils here <laughs> very much. Well, yes, I, I think I would have preferred of two evils in that case too, but I, I can relate with your friend because I really saw Hillary Clinton as, as just not likable. And I didn't like many of her political standpoints. And I, I just felt she represent the American people. She represented a portion of the American people. And that's the problem I have with with our current president and the a pro big problem I had with our previous president is that we keep voting in people with lots of money who came from money for the most part, you know, with the exception, uh, Obama, while he was, he's wealthy now, he didn't grow up wealthy, though he was middle class. So there, you know, and in fact, it's, it's interesting when Obama first put his name in the ring, I was not in favor of Obama because I thought he was too green. I didn't think he was you know, ready to lead a nation. And then he gave that, that speech on race relations. And I said, he could do the job. He, he's not going to do it perfect. And he made a lot of mistakes. He, he did some things and made some choices that were not necessarily right, but no human is going to be perfect. Um, but I think that our leader, the person that should represent us as a nation should be a person that represents the people and understand that the people of the United States are the root of every choice you make. And I, with the exception of a handful of presidents in the last hundred or so years, I don't think most of our presidents have had that going for them and definitely not a lot of the candidates lately. You know, lately we just keep getting more people that don't represent what Americans look like. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have, you know, somebody that literally looks like everybody in America. I mean, that understands that there are, you know, billions of people in this country and we all come from different walks of life and we all step into the arena of being Americans from a different context. And it's a, not an easy job to think about, hey, we've got uh. all these millions of people who are different I have to find the best solution for the most of them, as, I, as many of them as I can, 
And I think Hillary didn't have that ability. I don't think Trump had that ability. And I'm not sure Biden has that ability. I, I think that they have the ability to see what's right in front of them and nothing more. And, and that's not what a leader should have. So being likable though is part of that. Being able to be nonpartisan, <coughs> be able to cross build bridges between the parties in a way that's not meant to be fascist, but a way that's meant to be building a bridge and making things better and creating change and making us aware that there is there can be something better on the other side is very helpful. Um, but I do agree that I, I would have rather had the lesser of the two evils at that election as well. But who, who knows where we would be now if we did? I mean, like we can't go back and change it. I wish we could have that time machine. Man, that would be nice. <laughs> exactly. But what, would okay. we, but what would we change? I mean. Mm -hmm. Truth be told, if you go back and change something, it could make everything much worse or it could make everything much better. We, mm -hmm. we can't be sure. Um, and that's the plight of time travel conundrums. But that's, yeah. Bob, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, you, you said you studied uh, fascism. Uh, did, you, did you read uh, all about El Duce? Uh, uh, Mussolini. I mean, he's the quintessent quintessential fascist in our I, time. I have I have read about Mussolini. Yes, I have. I very well versed in, you know, European fascism, both from World War One and World War Two. Though I am not necessarily as up to speed as having read it, like in the last week or anything. It's been a few years. Would you agree that today the word fascism is really just used to mean uh, somebody you don't agree with and what we what we really have is not like, like especially like when it's directed towards republicans that's not fascism when you're you know uh when you're a party that believes in uh you know the second amendment i'd certain, certainly say oh, that that's not no, no. i i wouldn't say that that would be fascist behavior at all I, i'm a person that doesn't necessarily rely on labels i rely on practices and evidence to explain so like I actually have this thing about calling you know calling anybody names or 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 attacking anybody it, and, and, it, and the part the, and the party yeah. that wants the party that wants less government that would not be fascist correct isn't that's not, not a of fascism is it not necessarily fascism is about power and about how you would go about having power so you could have less government but have more power through more vicious means and more manipulative and control means and still be fascist. Well, it is st it's state control of everything, right? Um, for the most part, yes. I mean, we're, we're when you're talking about fascism, you're talking about a state control, more of a total the negative side of totalitarian leadership where you have this aspect of a government controlling the people by any means necessary. Um, <laughs> But it's not always as cut and dry and as simple as that. You know, we, we try to put government types and government practices in boxes, neat and tidy. And, and the reality is they're not neat and tidy. You know, when we look at um, history and look at, for instance, Hitler, and, you know, there's that joke that goes around, who would you go back in time and kill to prevent things? And they, they talk about Hitler, Wilson, and... Um, Prime Minister of England during World War II. I can't remember his name. Churchill. Churchill. And, you know, Hitler's valedictorian of his class. He had straight A's. He was a, you know, award winning, you know, in all these awards. The other two had all sorts, one was arrested, the other did a whole lot of other things. And so we look to what they did in their lives, you know, post looking back. And we see, you know, just because someone had and a Boy Scout type person and just like on paper was this perfect image doesn't mean that they wouldn't become and lead a nation through social control to such an extreme as as Hitler did. So we, we have to be really careful to when we're thinking about what makes fascism and what makes a country get into that trap of practicing a government like that. It's not quite as cut and dry and you can see evidence of seeds being planted even 20 years before the root of the government takes hold. 
I uh, like to say that we had a speaker, David Ramsey Steele, who spoke on the topic of fascism. And I believe if you go to the lecture library of the college, you well, yeah, I know you will find his presentation and um, a link to his article, which has been published in several articles, several magazines. Yeah, uh, David Ramsey Steele is a rather regular speaker of ours. So, all right, who's got the next question? All right, uh, Bonnie Jean, if I uh, could ask you, um, what do you think? Do you think there's any hope for unifying the two parties or uh, changing the political identity of America to a certain degree where we can unify? I think that until we start talking, and stop name calling and attacking, that there'll be no hope for change. Once we start seeing people as the unique, beautiful humans that they are, then we can begin to create a unified, a truly unified nation under the constitution as it was intended. But until that happens, we're, we're, do we're still doomed in my mind as we're still going to trap each other in boxes and in stereotypes and in discrimination and in limits. And we'll still keep people, you know, pushing people down because of social or race or religion or whatever choice somebody's making to <coughs> decide that they're not worthy of whatever aspect of America you want them to have or they want themselves to have. So I, I hope so. I dream of a unified country. I also dream of a unified world. You know, I think that it would be beautiful to have a world where we don't have bombings everywhere and we don't have, well, this is getting, uh, uh, you know, into the, 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 the ethical side of me, but I, I, I just want to see a world where we, we stop with the hate in general. And I think that is par part of the root of our problem and why this two party system has still maintains its hold on American political identity. Uh, Tim? Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, Charlie. Yes, Bonnie Jean. Uh, I, for a number of years, I've been serving on endorsement committees and candidate committees for the FL CIO and Independent Voters of Illinois and uh, the Green Party. And we have independent candidates who show up seeking our endorsement and wanting to get on the ballot. And quite frankly, there's a reason why they're, they're third party people. They're, some of these people are, I, I'm sorry, they're, they're disturbed. Uh, I mean, I've listened to things. I, I still recollect one candidate for Congress who was running on a campaign that God was ang God was angry with the United States. Uh, uh, I I mean there are reasons sometimes where these people are third party. But I mean they're not credible can the term is credible candidate. Well, first, I'm I'm not sure what your question is in that. That's well, I mean, I you 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 were saying we're denying access to these individuals, and I'm saying who are we denying access to the ballot? I mean, I my experience has been it's maybe a better idea to I might even say to keep these people off the ballot. So that they never occupy office. But is it your place or my place to deny them the right to the ballot and allow the people to see that for themselves? That's the well, question. Well, there is a process. Right. So, you know, I, I just because you don't believe in the same things as somebody else doesn't necessarily mean they're crazy or off the wall or unqualified for the job. Like I have people who think I am you know, crazy for not wanting to call people names. And I will call people out of them. I've lost friends when people call others names and I call them out on it. And I think it's so really- So we should have elections without absent all criteria? 
No, I think there, I didn't say that. I mean, somebody who is running to sit on the school board should have some criteria and have understanding of what a school needs, uh, but it's not necessarily up to one individual or two individuals to decide who goes on that ballot. It's for the voters to decide who makes it off the ballot and onto the seat or into the office. And, you know, being able to throw your hat in the ring, if you can get your you know, 150 signatures or whatever the criteria is for the office you're running for, and you have people who are signing and standing behind you. So like, it's funny, I am, a, I am a registered Democrat, but I have signed petitions for Democrats, Republicans, Green Party, Libertarians, because my thought is, my right is, it's not my right to prevent them from being on the ballot. It's my job to prevent them from winning the election if I feel that they're not qualified. And I will work towards helping somebody else win. So I, I have no problem with them getting on the ballot. I, you know, if it's somebody that I'm worried about, you know, I mean, truth be told, somebody who is in a, runs in a different circle than I am altogether is probably not going to ask me to sign their petition. But I haven't, I have done it because give them a chance to have their voice heard. And if they come across to the rest of the world as not being qualified, they're not going to win. It, I, I, have tr I have faith in the process to not deny them the opportunity to try. And, and I guess that's... How, how does the Green Party determine what candidates get on the ballot? Then by somebody just notifying us? Well, I think if we're using continuing with the primary system, it should be the same way. They have to have the petitions that are normally part of it. And then once they pass the petition part, their name goes on the ballots for the Green Party primary. And then from there, if they get on the ballot, but the, you know, whoever wins the Green Party primary gets on the ballot for the other, you for the main election. That's, that's how it should be. I, I'd like to tell my experience. I actually was, and Charlie knows this because he was there vetting, but I, I had the chance to be on the green ticket party ticket for Congress. And, um, and then, it, so there were like 10 people or on the call. And um, this is the district where Rahm Emanuel was before um, running against Quigley. Um, and uh, they, you know, of everything I said, I said, you know, but I think the most important thing is to or is it, why are you running? I said, you know, my own experience, there's been like corruption personally, and I see corruption. People can't get on the ballot and um, that's what we have to deal with. But they picked out that I was evidence of anti-Semitic language. And so, you know, I removed the anti-Semitic language of like, you know, I think it's a problem slaughtering Palestine. And, um, you know, they ended up, uh, running, you know, sticking some Jewish guy in there in front of me, you know, and so this, it's come down to 10 people, and um, it, and I was like, you know, wow, because I actually had read that Dave Ick said, a conspiracy theorist, but also very informed, that there is a um, high influence of Zionist revisionism, you know, on all the parties, but in particularly the Green, which was kind of news to me, but uh, I think everyone should try to get on the ballot. And um, I think that's where the problems start. It's not so much, it's kind of, I think, a distraction, this idea, you know, and a deliberate distraction in states' rights areas to, you know, make a big deal of, on a non-issue of whether somebody's voting twice, whereas the real issue is people are blocked through mm -hmm. gerrymandering, through, you know, a decision, I mean, say, you know, every they both people got all the ballots, which is not easy to do in a gerrymandered area. But, um, you know, also when a newcomer like me could not even get ballots in the grocery store, not allowed in the parking lot of the grocery store, not allowed in the nursing home, because the precinct captains are driving around pressuring people not to not to let me stand there. Um, senior homes not allowed. Uh, you know, my area is it's like there's no just doors to knock on. And um, so this was over the Thanksgiving, but there's a lot of barriers to mm -hmm. um, the way the party is just totally rigged in terms of who they'll let on. And the number one thing is they say, 
you can't be someone who tells the truth, who's honest, who, you know, you've got to take the money and, and you got to do what we do. You got to do the party line. And that's, that's why I think the parties really, you know, are just totally corrupt. They should be disbanded like the CIA should be disbanded, you know, because they're the same thing, essentially, you know, an organized crime syndicate that has bought these, especially post Citizens United. The, and, um, uh, the political yeah. parties have to meet the same criteria for getting on the ballot as any independent. Well, so they're not given a pass. No, I mean, the political parties have $10 trillion to pick their candidate and they run against the anyone who's going to speak out against Israel's forever war on Palestine and the rest of the world and surveillance and the CIA. So you can it's very easy to run somebody against someone. Cynthia McKinney, you know, look what they did to her on the Green Party. You know, why is the Green Party not why is nothing? Nobody's liberal. And the ones who might have been liberal socialists, they got run against. Look at Bernie Sanders. You know, um, I think the main thing that qualifies everybody that you see is they're for ever war, they're for APAC, they're for the NRA, and they're for more policing and more drugs. And, you know, let's, what's the solution? Uh, let's not let the criminals out. The ones that we put a, put away wrongly, we gave them, CIA brought in the marijuana. The All drug, right, I won't cross the drug talk. laws in. I I'm sorry to say anything talk, about FBI Alan, to you, Charlie, because you're one of them. And that's why you there were 200 you six, this thing and censor us from talking there about There were 200, 263 candidates for 50 aldermanic jobs in Chicago. <sighs> some, of the eight, some of the wards had eight candidates. Do you think all of those eight candidates had Who gets any put on the ballot? Only one Green Party person. I don't know. Why should you be on the me ballot? And, and this other guy off the Green Party thing. You know, we're, we weren't any less qualified. It was just a... You, you didn't know, answer make my sure question. Make sure anybody who is not going to be totally for Israel and Rahm Emanuel and their policing surveillance takeover of the world can't be on there. So all those 280, 63 candidates no, should I'm be on the ballot? No, I'm just saying, Charlie, you were one of the 10 people who made sure I wasn't on the candidate. No, this I is between you and me and the way you surveil that. this whole group. And it's not easy to talk about the fact that you won't let me talk about the virus because, you know, because FBI won't let you let me. Because Bill, you're on the Red Squad. You, you answered, so. answered a question. And that's what you're telling me. Are you not candidates. on the Red Squad? Is that what you told me, Charlie? All right, all right. You know, and if I got in there, I'd say, you're on the Red Squad, Charlie. And that's why you won't, you vote for people Let's, that uh, are, for, for the establishment, yes, for the, for, attack, war, for the guns, for the corruption. And it, to call out corruption is a fucking death knell to any candidate who wants to run. You know, and there, Ellen, there's parties uh, have their way. They killed John F. Kennedy. Ellen, they, you I know, and he was running, you know, so make sure the CIA, the FBI has got, got their way of making sure that we're going to be at a forever war. If you talk about 9-11, you know, oh, Paul Ellen. Wellstone, what happened to him? You know, I mean, people get disappeared. Nowadays, it's real convenient with the Internet to just yeah, make I, I, sure I, nobody I, hears them. Or they, it's no, you don't even see when Ellen, you've been shown up uh, parties. My own suggestion, Ellen, if you want to do this again, is uh, you need to get a little more uh, clear on some of your speeches. And, oh, uh, give me a break, okay? Thanks, Tim. Well, no, I just... There's real fucking issues here, and it doesn't matter whether I say them. If you can't hear them, if you can't see them, and if it's never on the radio and no politician is talking about it, those real issues like, oh, they're killing communists, aren't they? You know, those will live. That's what we've got. That's how I define okay, okay. fascism. My apologies, Ellen, but uh, let's uh, move on. Joseph, sure. do you have a question? Well, I wanted to address that really, really. Please, Bunny Jean, I please go yeah. ahead. So, Ellen, in many ways, you're you're absolutely right. Um, there is a there are many many barriers to getting on a ballot. When I ran for for the board of the the school board they actually expected me to sign a document declaring that I was not a communist as a leftover um, control tool from the 1940s. They said I didn't have to sign it, but if you don't sign it, they let people know. I, I went ahead, I'm not officially part of the communist party. It's fine, it's no big deal. But it, um, it was very interesting to me because here we have a society where it doesn't even understand what something like communism is that has practices with issues all over the world. 
I think sometimes we get very heated in our thoughts about what's going on in the world. What's happening in Palestine and Israel is a good example. It's, it's absolutely horrible. And uh, the way it's being talked about across the board is problematic. And we should be able to talk about it to end the reasons why it's happening and to end violence without necessarily ending the respect for the group, the bridges. So I hear every word you're saying has truth in it, Ellen. I just, I would love to talk to you after to, you know, you know, there are ways to um, speak a calm voice and stay calm. Like, I don't agree with a lot of what Charlie is saying, not be, but I respect the right to say it and that, and that's okay. I think that people who have fulfilled the requirements to get on the ballot should, but the barriers that exist between having to sign declarations, lack of money, I mean, there should be campaign spending limits and people who have money, you know, I didn't win the election for two reasons. One, I didn't have enough money and I was running against four incumbents. The four incumbents were going to win pretty much no matter what I did, even though I was favored in the media, I was, I was picked out in all in every media thing as being a favored newcomer and somebody that they would like to see on the board. Um, I didn't win, but I was the first person who ran and didn't win to put, put on a committee for the board. So I, I still won in the end because I'm still serving the community. Uh, but these barriers are real and, and they, they need to be overcome. And sometimes the barriers are rooted in discriminatory actions. And it's sad to know that that kind of thing still is happening. But I believe very strongly that if you can meet the criteria that is set forth in the law to get on the ballot, it doesn't matter what you put on your website, it doesn't matter what you do, that's for the voters to make their decision about, not for committees deciding to put people on or off. Um, Body Jean, that criteria barrier to being a no communist that's in every nationwide union contract it's not in my it's not, yes there i said you nationwide contracts yeah that language is still in there it's not in my contract I'm well it's in there it's somewhere it's in the it's in the law it's labor law will whether it's in there or not taken out you know i mean that's uh, what this war against the communism is the one that has to stop you know yeah, i mean it's sense. always been a big yeah. lie you know it's uh that, that is fascism to ma manufacture wars and dirty wars against communists you know there uh, was a strong communist party that was good yeah. until mccarthy and whatever you want to call that right yeah. um uh, ellen you are perfectly you were there the fact that there is this hate still towards communism without people understanding it is a problem, but I don't want to delve into that discussion. That's for another presentation. <laughs> but then, I know, I know Joseph had a question, right? So I, I wanted Joseph, go ahead. Okay, let Joseph ask a question. Question number yes. one would be, uh, Bonnie Jean, you look very stylish, especially your glasses. Were you where do you buy it from? That is number one. Uh, let me add something substantive to that. My apologies, I missed early part of your presentation. And looking at uh, the title, uh, you said that there uh, was or is an ethical downfall of American political identity. So I'm assuming that uh, this uh, evil uh, which uh, is uh, implied with either party happened at some point. So up until what timeline, uh, it was not the case. And then there was an ethical downfall and now you portray them as evil. <laughs> um, yeah, so my glasses, I got at Costco. They, I like them because they look like butterflies to some degree. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, as to, yes, pol the political downfall has been a continual thing for the last 200 years, but it really started seeing evidence of it um, happening post Civil War. And I think there have been other factors at play and it's been really strong, especially the last 
20 years. So we've had ebbs and flows where it goes up and down. And as someone pointed out earlier that, yes, we have had outlier scenarios mm -hmm. like with, with the moose party in the 20s and things along those lines, but it's nothing is ever absolute, but generally speaking, we do see these trends and especially since McCarthyism actually in the, in the 40s and 50s, we have had an even greater strength in the separation between the parties, the, the Republicans and the Democrats. So there, the timeline isn't exactly fluid. It's, it has ups and downs when you look at it through history. So yeah, so that was a good question, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Let me follow up. Uh, so you put your uh, finger on McCarthyism. Mm -hmm. So does it mean that uh, um, putting people who are on the other side um, on the left or you know, using the brush uh, mm -hmm. to give a red tint, uh, that is uh, one of the fundamental uh, reasons here for this uh, downfall? It was there always, I thought. I think that when we are talking about how um, the political downfall, I'm talking about the, the constant pull away from the Constitution and what it intends for us as a nation uh, to have a government that is for the people, by the people, of the people. And we have become a government that's for the for the people that the government represent, or um, you know, I, I'm I'm reticent to say it, but I think about the propaganda that Hitler put out, you know, some ten years before the Holocaust happened, when he was first running for Freyer, and he said in these talks, you know, I want to have jobs for the rightful German, I want to have jobs for the, I, I want to have money, I want to get homes back to the rightful Germans. He never once defined what the rightful Germans were when he was running those elections early on. He didn't define them until 10 years later, but he used that phrasing over and over and over again to get elected into office. And I think it's important when we think about history and think about how we were intended to have our political you know, landscape it was not intended to be this, how do I want to word it? It wasn't intent, I don't believe that our forefathers intended for it to be so um, rooted in so much animosity and, and hate towards each other and buried in the battles constantly back and forth for power, that it was supposed to be people who wanted to do good in the nation who may have different belief structures, but were willing to work together to create a more perfect union. And we are so far from trying to become a more perfect union that that is the downfall of American political identity. Thank you. Uh, what I heard in what you said is that uh, there is hyper-nationalism uh, paralleling uh, uh, what Fuhrer came up with. And also in the American context, uh, I think you say something to the effect that there is a swaying away from the spirit of the constitution. Yes. Um, with uh, my engineering background, I will again push you. Uh, so Fine. where is it that uh, we can make the correction? Uh, if, if we can uh, point out um, a few uh, factors where a correction is practically um, feasible or possible? I think that it's a long road to have real change, but I do believe that it starts at the local level. First, we need to bring in people at the local level who listen and will speak truth and aren't afraid to say what they believe on, you know, out there and speak truth and can back that truth up with documentation and, and the like. Um, and I think that we also need to stop, you know, condemning somebody for their belief structure. You know, we've already, we've, even in this conversation tonight, we've seen a little bit of 
um, heatedness happen I, I because of difference of opinions and you know I'm not one who believes in 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 God or religion or any of that but there is a scripture in the Bible a soft answer turneth away wrath and I love that scripture from the Bible even though I don't believe the Bible is the the center of it should be the center of everything but that message is really where truth can rest because if we're if we have this soft answer and we listen and we we are honest with each other and talk and have dialogue i i feel that we will end up getting to a place where we can ultimately return to the spirit of the living breathing document that is supposed to ground us as an american people thank you thank you uh, if, if i wrap it up <laughs> <laughs> uh, what i hear is that uh, it is not essentially in the nationalistic realm, but it, but it is in the local and neighborhood where there could be a solution. In that token, I would say that the neighborhood is drastically changing. It is not what it used to be a hundred years ago, not even mm -hmm. 25 years ago. So it boils down to your tolerance and thinking and accommodation or change of thinking uh, to deal with the real change uh, in the local neighborhood. For example, where I live in Elmhurst, Elmhurst is not what it used to be. When I came here 25 years ago, people look different, talk different. Uh, so there is uh, a real melting uh, pot of uh, different viewpoints, and I will even use the word uh, culture. So it all boils down to be not political, uh, as it sounded at the outset. Uh, it comes into the realm of uh, the basic social fabric, sociology, mm -hmm. spirituality, etc. And uh, there I will stop. Thank you. You are you are absolutely correct, Joseph. And and you should read a book by Robert Putman called Bowling Alone, and he will yet that will really exemplify what you just said. <laughs> Thank Dan, you. I, I'm will do. Will do. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Dan. Unmute. All right, I'm unmuted. <laughs> so, uh, you, you know, Abraham Lincoln, Dr. Gene, mm -hmm. was president in 1860. He was not on the ballot. Lincoln was not on the ballot in like five slave states. Uh, like he won like 1% of the vote in Kentucky, 1% mm -hmm. in Virginia. But he won like all the northern states, New York, Illinois. Uh, and so, I mean, if people can take off people off the ballot, um, if they don't agree with you, uh, do you agree with that? No, not at all. Uh, oh. I think that if you are old enough to vote, you should be allowed to vote. And if you are old enough to be on the ballot and you get your signatures for your petition and you turn them in by the date, you should be on the ballot, period. There, 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 there should be no limits to, to that. Um, right. You know, if you, if you are doing what you're supposed to, um, challenge the signatures, but don't challenge somebody based on their beliefs. Let the voters decide from there. Because I suspect that even if they had been, if he had been on the ballot in those five day, five states, he wouldn't have won. So, but put him on the ballot. Let your people speak for the, for you. If you're the only reason to prevent someone being on a ballot is because you are afraid that they are that they will create the change that is there, um, and that is where social control comes into play from a governmental perspective. Mm -hmm. So, wouldn't you say? Uh... Anyways, would you say that getting outside of government, like people who loot or bomb, church bombs, uh, 
uh, Target or uh, Macy's downtown Chicago, would you say that's a legitimate way of, of, of being against the government? I, I'm not sure I understand what you mean. I mean, you say that that's social control, right. voting and social control. So how do you get out of social control? Or is that in your thinking? When we have extreme social control that is preventing people from being on ballots or preventing daily life, you know, having allowing us to walk around the way we are supposed to have freedom, um, we we are on a tightrope between having that tyranny happen again. We don't want tyranny to happen again. I, I think that I think universally we can agree that tyranny is a bad thing. That unless you are the person who wants to wield the control and wield the weapon of tyranny, then we pretty much can agree that that's bad. Um, but I think that it's it's a fine line and it gets kind of complicated because we do have things that happen in this world that are pretty bad. And government in and of itself is not bad. If it's run properly and the way they designed it in the constitution, that's why I come back to the constitution so much. The way it was designed with the checks and balances and the ability to change it as a living, breathing document over time gives us a means to allow for the voice of the people to be exerted through the practice of government. The problem happens when corrupt people or people who become corrupted get into power. I think someone said that you can't really be honest when you are a politician. I, I don't agree with that. I think the problem is that honest politicians don't make it very far because of the corruption that's happening them, around them. And so we have to look at it from the perspective of there is great fear and that's what for instance, the McCarthy hearings were all about great fear of change and a threat to the economic system of capitalism. And the irony there is we don't really have a capitalistic society in America. We have a, we have a mixed economy here and that is built both in capitalism and socialism. And we are afraid of the socialistic side. Not we, I mean, we as a nation, people are afraid. Those in power are afraid because those in power have money. And if you take away the capitalistic side, you end up taking away the money. And if they don't have the money, what do they have? They lose the power potentially. Um, okay. So yeah, so it's, it's there, I think there are layers to it and I think it gets much more complicated. And when you start talking about, you know, how you can have a government that is run, when you start getting a population as large as ours, it becomes much mm -hmm. more difficult to not have it corrupted. Okay. Thanks. Okay, who's next on the questions? Bob, you got anything else or Ellen or Bob? Yeah, I, I guess I'll ask one is, you know, I, what do you think about my, you say you like the constitution thinking that it's a moving, breathing, growing thing and we know that the Federalists and the Federalist Society of Judges and the um, wanted to be fixed and originalist. And, uh, you know, to me that and it, that kind of that that's what I'm just so worried about. And that um, this, you know, the conservative Republican is it nowadays it seems to have been captured by you know, actually Carl Schmidt and some, but I, I think capitalism has captured democracy. I used to think they were the same thing, but, um, you know, I, I was a market researcher and studied it. And I, I now, um, I just, it seems like the supply side, the, the people at the top, the capitalists don't want to, they don't care what consumers want, what voters want, what the people want. There's such a huge gap with the platforms and I, I guess one idea I don't know if they you know if they talk about this and you've read about it but it's like can we just vote on the platform and not the person because uh you know they're the person might say they're for the things they say but they're just they seem to be really 
just, you know, Lori Lightfoot flipped on the, the you know, let's have give 1.6 billion to this TIF area that to develop an area, which she said she wasn't going to do, but they just, they flip flop and they accuse the other person of doing what they do, which is usually, you know, so, I mean, the, there's no accountability to the truth that, and I don't know how, um, but I think maybe if we could, in this last election, basically, you know, the Republican, it was a Donald Trump platform. They didn't even pretend they had anything other than Donald Trump on it. And that's kind of fascist, but, uh, you know, the, um, it doesn't, like, nowhere is there a peace anywhere that I've seen. And I, that's what worries me. I, I just, I see biological warfare and it's classified and I just don't know how peace has a chance, you know, or democracy with, if there's a lot of money and bombs and biological warfare like viruses and, uh, you know, they don't have to say anything because they can control the media. And uh, I, I, I have to say one thing, I'm really encouraged by your sociology background. I've never really formally studied it, but my stepfather who was kind of very, very kind of fascist leaning as just all capitalism, no, no democracy. And um, he used to say sociology proves nothing. And I, as I kind of in my phase of life where I'm kind of seems like question, you know, everything he said was wrong because it was kind of this assertions from above. But I think, is there any reason, I mean, have you ever heard this statement, sociology proves nothing? I mean, to me, it proves everything, you know, I mean, analyze it, but anyhow, there, if you have comments on that. There are many who see sociology as a um, soft, arena and that we don't really do anything of value, but we do, we delve into studying living, breathing social structures. We're studying, you know, it come, the history of sociology for those who don't know it, we come out of anthropology and anthropology studies dead cultures, cultures that have disappeared. They, they, they study the past. And someone said, we need, who is, if we're studying the past, who studies the future? And born out of the cultural anthropology track was sociology at, at University of Chicago, actually. We were born, the, the field was born at, in Chicago. So we are a, a Chicago-based field some 150 some odd years ago now. But we really delve into the different aspects of how human nature collides with societal nature and you know case in point you bring up you know platform versus people and the reality is this is where the evil comes from or the evil quote unquote because people are corruptible and money has ultimately corrupted the democratic system quite regularly and this is the problem with a two-party system that allows for all the barriers to entrance that we have that said, people do will argue that sociology, the people will come into my classes all the time and, and get to the middle of it and go, this is, sociology is easy. Why are you making it so hard? And it's like, well, sociology isn't easy because humans aren't easy. People aren't easy to understand. They change, they change their minds. They, they lie to get what they want. They manipulate, there's anarchy. They don't understand what terms mean. So they don't, it doesn't play out the way they think it will. And they want to interpret everything from their background instead of from the people. Like I, I practice ethnography specifically as a, as a style of research. And I can't look at another culture from my culture's perspective. I have to walk a mile in their shoes as best I can and tell the story from their perspective, not mine. And they people don't realize that that's not easy to do. It's not easy to walk in and out of different cultures and really try to understand the culture from its root instead of just from the superficial looking into it. So, yeah, so I think Bob has another question. Yeah, but Bonnie, do you think that, uh, you know, if, if we had a smaller government, let's say, you know, more aligned to what the government consisted of back in the days of the founding, which, which is, you know, really uh, just, um, uh, you know, the protection of uh, people from all threats, foreign and domestic, and then enforcement of contracts in the courts, and that's about it. 
wouldn't it wouldn't there be a lot less need for uh you know uh, all this political jockeying that we see in the two-party system because there you know there wouldn't be all this uh, uh you know what it amounts to be is the reason we have these parties is because you have different identity groups jockeying for uh some type of privilege over the, the other groups all the time but if we didn't have all these you know if the government wasn't you know if, the, if they didn't you know didn't control the printing press and you know, reward certain groups instead of other ones and things like that. If they just, if government just stuck to, you know, police, you know, fire, military, you know, for, you know, foreign domestic, I mean, uh, uh, foreign military engagements and then enforcing contracts in the courts, wouldn't there be a lot less uh, of this political jockeying and, you know, a lot less uh, importance put on it? In the Constitution, it doesn't talk about political parties at all. It doesn't talk about a lot of the things that we practice in our government. A lot of the laws passed by legislation by the legislative branch um, at, at the state level and the federal level or even the local level are not accounted for in the Constitution. Those are 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 passed by the people that are represented. But doesn't it make sense though if, if, right. if we had a government that wasn't involved in all this all this other stuff? That Not at all. So the a... constant the constitution or represented representation based on the population size. So the con it, it's it's hard to do a comparative um, to the size of the government in the 1780s. Well, I'm talking about I'm talking about the necessity of all this all the party politics. Do you know? Yeah, don't, you, don't you think okay. there'll, be less, there'll be less polarity? You know, been between the two, uh, you know, uh, and you know, and that less animosity if the government really just basically, you know, enforced contracts in the courts and uh, provided for the common defense. And yeah, allow allow all the pollution you want. Um, I'll, I'll let me let me get there, Bob. Uh, basically, the Constitution calls for us to grow the government with the with the population of the people. So that the people are represented by an appropriate number of representatives. The problem with growing a government is now you have more people involved and you need more regulation and then that leads to greater corruption across the board. So I agree with you to some extent that because our government has grown that allows for greater animosity and problems and back and forth between the parties, but I do think that if we return to an ideal aspect of what the Constitution calls for, which is actually more complex than just contracts and, you know, common defense, there is more rooted into the Constitution than just those two things. Um, it's, it's nuanced with eight articles and, you know, the, I think, what, 45 now amendments and, and the like. So it is, there, there is more to it than that, but I agree to some degree to some degree that you are right, that if we return to the fundamentals of this living, breathing document, um, that thankfully the Federalists lost because the Federalists did want it to be a stagnant, this is it, period. But they lost that battle. It became the living, breathing, changeable document that it is because we do change over time. Um, so I, I think that it becomes much more complicated than just being cut and dry let's just return to this but i do think that if we got rid of a lot of the red tape and a lot of the extraneous aspects of government and that's a failing of the checks and balancing system you know we put in the they put in place a checks and balance and that checks and balance has failed us over time and we need to go back to allowing that checks and balance to do its job properly. So, that this one and one last thing: since you're a teacher, um, <laughs> does, does the constitution is there some kind of anything in the constitution about the government? Uh, you know, it has to uh, provide an education to the people. That that's a government responsibility or duty. <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head um, without having reread it in the last week. Um, I don't, it doesn't talk about specific, I have to double check it. I don't want to answer that because I know parts of the constitution better than other parts. 
And I, I mean, I can open it up and look, but I, I don't believe it specifically calls for education. It calls for the protection and well-being and, and providing for um, the growth of the people and the pursuit of happiness of which education is part of. And laws have been put in place to provide for the education, but I'd have to double check to, to speak affirmatively with positive, you know, I, I'm acknowledging that I haven't re read the parts that I don't read on a regular basis. Because I'm human and I, I don't have everything in my head at all times. <laughs> I, I don't think I don't think it's I don't think there's any rules in there pertaining to education in Not, the Constitution. It's Not things specifically. About, yeah, it's yeah. Things, yeah, things about transfer of power and things like that, but not education. Oh, oh. All right. Um, is there any more questions for uh, Bonnie Jean? Otherwise, I'd like to go to. Uh, yeah, I had one, Tim. Go right ahead, Charlie. Yes. Uh, in the current presidential situation, uh, there are 50 primaries conducted across the state and at least a dozen candidates for each political party um, in which the people choose the candidates for president of the United States, um, which is a pluralistic system. I've often been concerned. How is it that people who are, let's say, not a member of a political party, have never worked for it or campaigned for it or contributed to it, are choosing the candidate to that party. I mean, when I go to a union convention, there's all sorts of criteria in order for me to vote on what the union does, in order for me to be granted credentials. But now we have a process where anybody is choosing the candidates of a political party. The people are voting for the candidates. So um, as someone who has served as a voting entity for the union, I can actually speak with knowledge on this. But before I do that, um, the 14th Amendment of the Constitution actually addresses public education and the right of people not to be denied entrance into public education. So I, and, and it is a direct result of the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision. So. Um, I just wanted to address, or it's connected to the Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, so I just looked that up so we could address that and put a pin in that. Um, as to this, um, so with the union, my local votes me in to represent them at the resident, uh, representative assembly. At the representative assembly, after being voted in by my local, I am a representative for my local. I was actually this year, I was a representative for the state as a whole because I was elected by the state, not just the local. So I represented my whole state as well as my local and I acted as a voice to represent their voice, much like our state representatives act as a voice in Congress for us as citizens. But every single person who is a member of the union has a right to vote who represents them at that represent, representative assembly just like in our government system, that's what democracy is, a representative democracy is all about. It's not actually pluralistic, it's representative democracy in which all of the people who meet the criteria for, for voting being, that is they're 18 years old and they, depending on if they're, they are 18 year old citizens of the country who have not lost the right to vote because of a felony conviction, because that's the only way you can lose the right to vote is having a felony conviction, being in prison, and you can get that retracted. Um, you have a right to vote for whoever you want to represent you. In so I can, you t I have a right to vote for Republican candidates, even you though do. I'm not in the Republican Party? It, yes, yeah. I, like when I'm I, not a member, I assure you. In the primary... The primary is designed to select the candidates. So that yeah. is to the parties so that you can decide who's going to make it to the final ballot. You have every right to go vote on a Republican ballot if you choose, but that means you can't vote on the Democratic ballot that time. There are a lot of people who, have cho who chose in the last election to on the primaries go vote for 
the in the primary for the opposite party to try to help shift and change what part who ended up on the final ballot. Um, so there is no you can change your party at any time you can you can alter where you end up being representat represented like at any moment you can change what you want to do. The reason I'm a Democrat has nothing to do with the party. It was simply when I went to vote the very first time and it was a primary, they said to me, are you a Democrat or Republican? And I said, I have no idea. Like, I just want to vote for Dick Durbin because I wanted to vote for Dick Durbin because he had helped me get a scholarship for college and he was a really great state representative and I wanted him to be senator. And so they're like, you can't say a candidate's name in here. Like they thought I was electioneering. And I'm like, I'm this 18 year old kid, barely fresh out of being, like I'd only been 18, like a week. The primary was a week after my birthday. Oh. And I was just like, really, I, I just want that ballot. There was literally no one in the, in the voting location except me and the judges, the election judges. And so it took me five or six minutes to explain to them, I have no idea if I'm a Democrat or Republican, I just want the ballot he's on. And so finally, another one of the judges went, just give her the Democratic ballot already. And so they did, and I voted and, and, and moved on. But And I since, of course, obviously, have learned more about the parties because I didn't like that feeling of not knowing. I didn't like not being able to have power over where my voice was heard. And... So I think it's important to think about that you have the power to change that. If you want to vote for a Republican on either the final ballot or on the preliminary ballot, you have every right at every stage. So I don't have to do anything. Is, is there an independent ballot? I, I guess I think, I think there should just be all independents, you know, I mean, uh -huh. make, could we make an amendment that says no parties, you know, or... I was thinking also if you what if you're going to make an amendment to address the you know hate or extremism um, divided what what how would you, you change can run what as amendments an independent, would you, put in? you can make up a party you can run as an independent no what if of what if there's just all independents we're you know just like a random sample one random sample of Americans and not divided into states and then you know they just they really voted um, you know, kind of like a market research survey does. It's like, you know, who are you? What do you want? And, um, oh, maybe based on your beliefs, they go, this is, there's something like that for religion that, you know, that's, oh, you're a Unitarian, you know? <laughs> and, and you didn't even know it, right? Um, I know when I went in, they go, are you going to be in the Democratic Party? Oh, yeah. And then I realized, well, does that seem to, when I'm running, indicate that they're giving me money, which they weren't? I, the real thing is I didn't want any money and I don't know, maybe that's why they threw me out, but uh, it's odd to have to be, it's gotten to the point where I wanted to run for Republican, but I get so turned off by, it's like I used to be kind of a Reagan Republican, but you know, it's like, I know, you know, the people that are in there now don't associate me with them. And it, it, it's gotten where I don't think people really belong in either of those parties. So I, but I, I don't know how we could change that, except maybe. If, you know. if I, I, I might think. interject, um, I voted in local elections on the Republican primary because uh, a Democrat is not going to get in in my neighborhood. And I wanted the better candidate to get in on the ballot. So I had to. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. I, but you had, you don't have to be on the ballot you could you could be a democratic ballot and vote for a republican but not in the can't you, do, in, the you don't, in, in the primary it doesn't matter right in the primary right. it's the, only the primary yeah. yeah in the primary you have to declare and only select one party but in the like i you know in the main election or the non primaries it doesn't you're not declaring anything it doesn't matter but once you go in and you know you go in on the primary and say i want a republican ballot i want a green party ballot i want then it changes your party on the official record and you have to change it either manually or at the next primary so um but it, yeah, i think we're getting into the weeds a little bit anybody right. can get on the ballot if they meet the criteria so if you want to create be an independent candidate on the presidential ballot and you meet the, the criteria in the constitution and then the criteria for the signatures, I think it's something like 
150,000 signatures you have to have to get on the ballot. If you can have, if you can meet the signature signatory requirement and you can, and you meet the age requirements, you can get on the ballot as an independent. And you just, you, whether you're associated with an independent party or not, you can get on the ballot. Just as a citizen, you can get on the ballot that way. Um, so there is no call, there is no criteria. Now they, now they may go through and look at every single signature you got on your, on your petition and try to throw them out. So, you know, while you only need a certain number, you always should get three times as many as the number you need. Otherwise uh, you might, they might cut half of them out and then you basically aren't eligible anymore. Uh, but so you can as an individual now, is it easy to do? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. I mean, that's how Ralph Nader got on the ballot the first time. He wasn't part of any, he, he made up his own party. So um, actually his book is kind of interesting. Uh, but, um, not that I would have voted for Nader. I don't think I was old enough yet. He, he was, that was when I was in high school still. And I'm now aging myself. But, but <laughs> yeah, so that, that's, yeah, that's, that's I, I think we're getting into the weeds a little too much though. And okay. There's might be uh might be time to go to rebuttals. Um, does everybody concur at this point? If there's no other questions, yeah, we'll... let's go. Very good. All right, Bonnie. What you're gonna do now is you're gonna get the last word. And, Yay! Uh, the last gonna... word, Bonnie Jean. <laughs> Bonnie Jean, you get the last word, which means you're able to comment on the rebuttals. Now, before you go, I had I just uh, email I just put in chat direct to you a filled out evaluation form. I got for, it. Okay, and uh, if you want, I can give you your uh, Toastmasters two minute evaluation now, if you'd like. Yeah, I don't need that so much. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm just no, it, it, it's it's good. I really thought you did a nice job on your speech, um, but I, I'm just saying you know, with the with the written form, I think it's official. Yeah. If you, want to, if you want to offline, I can do it. So, all right. Who, uh, what do you say about maybe five minutes each for rebuttals tonight? Um, and who would like to go first? I'll go. All right, Ellen. I got a clock and it's five minutes and uh, we'll okay. go from there. Well, maybe, maybe we'll make it six because of things. I'll just make it six minutes. All right. So go ahead, Ellen. Uh, start and okay. uh, go ahead. Just just to let you know, uh, yeah, you know, a re as a rebuttal, I'm not really, re I don't rebut anything you said. Um, I, I, so for the most part, I'm just gonna express my frustrations with the process that is, um, you know, I, I should learn how to be calmer about it, but it, I think I follow the idea that of Orwell to say, what they don't want you to say. Everything else is public relations, um, you know? And so I, I feel like, well, you know, I used to just be a market researcher who tried to read the, you know, voice of the people and the market. And, um, but I realized that capitalism never sponsored any actual analyses of, uh, of the, you know, of democracy and, and the threats, you know, that really that there was so much missed in um, really almost everything I learned in as a, I got an MBA in it, you know, because, you know, that doesn't make me angry, but what makes me angry is the, the political backstabbing, you know, and people always say, oh, politics are bad. And um, you see the culture is of a aggressive, defensive, or humanitarian. I, um, actually, we studied a lot, you know, ethnography. I kind of aspired to understand what that was. So I like that. But, you know, this, I think we've got an aggressive defensive dynamic, um, like a law firm, or I feel like it's like a legal case where everybody's corrupt, like Sophie Scholl. That's what I mean by fascism, that um, Sophie Scholl was, you know, this just for speaking out in the 40s. Uh, Honestly, the White Rose movement was they, you know, judge, they cut off her head, you know, for speaking. And um, that, you know, when there's, you can't dissent, you can't question uh, the, um, or, or just point out corruption. I, that's, that's been my biggest boohoo. And, um, and I think it, it's hard to, 
it's hard to, uh, you know, you can talk about corruption. I'll write about it. I try to, you know, during elections. Oh, did you know, did you know Ken Starr, this was this week, was the one that originally got um, Epstein the light sentence. <laughs> um, you know, it's, uh, how can you expose these guys and they just get away with it? You know, it seems to win them credit, the more pedophiles and evil and people go, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. Even though, you know, there doesn't, I also found out that in 1981, Reagan signed um, a law that said the CIA and the, the Justice Department, there'll be no investigation. So they get to have Iran-Contra and the drug wars and, you know, um, throw in the, contract with America and the super predator laws and blame it all on Clinton. And, and then they also control this Inslaw promise software, which means they can, they can like make a troll army of a million people. And, you know, they all blame it on Russia or make it look like it came from Russia or make it look like it came from Iran so that, or China, you know, and um, I think that's why I'm so frustrated with, you know, the, or just decide any word on vaccine, any comment will get you deplatformed. Over 200,000 people have been deplatformed for just posting scientifically, like logical free speech articles like, um, oh, do you think it matters that this virus was manufactured by Fauci and Gates at Fort Detrick? And, you know, um, as a form of bioweapons so, and a vaccine, and our Congress paid for it with the Biological Weapons Act and Vaccine Development Act. But if anybody says that, including me, deplatformed, you know, gone. And um, I heard these people talk about it in Germany. This guy's trying to figure out how to have a lawsuit um, against this whole thing. And not just if, you know, it's violated our rights for a 1%, 2% fatality, if anything, but our government made it, you know, our Department of Defense, our, our Fauci, you know, they made money on it. All the people in Congress, the reason why they're letting this happen is, you know, is like, well, you know, they'll fire me if I don't. No media person can tell the truth. It's never even been mentioned on national public radio. So I'm like, I've got to go fight this free speech issue. And, um, but, you know, so Fauci, Barr, I mean, they basically said, no, uh, no justice in this country. And it, you know, it's just, I actually heard all the Supreme Court people uh, talk and they're like, they're, have you ever, um, you know, had made any decisions, Brett Kavanaugh, you know, predator, you know, on um, the rights? He goes, no, that never came up. So this is what I'm saying to you, Bob, if we just had uh, contracts, police and firemen, it would kind of like leave out all the rights protections. Not that they actually protect rights, but it, you know, and I, I mean, you, you um, sound more, you know, positive. Maybe if I, um, I hung around, you know, teachers and teachers unions, uh, I wouldn't be quite as discouraged as I am just uh, an adult child of a Republican family or actually a libertarian family. Uh, Adam Smith, you know, Milton Friedman, Ayn Rand, you know, it's like, okay, well, um, you know, just let the owners decide. Let's just get, let the 1% decide and all the innovation in the world will come about, you know, don't listen to the, the parasites like, you know, like Democrats and liberals and social welfare queens. And, but, you know, the fact is right now we've got nothing but propaganda wars, you know, most all coming from the right. I don't know any from the left. And um, it's just gotten more extreme. And it's because it's at the state level, the Federalist Society, you say, oh, we got past the Federalist Party, but they put it back in. Every single judge that has been put in since the beginning of Trump has been a Federalist Society, which means they are going to vote that the corporation is, is a person that has total, you know, give them all the freedom for the ownership society to have all the money and all the capital and, um, you know, don't burden them if, with any regulations, you know, so get rid of EPA, get rid of uh, air, you know, there's, we, we talked about this environment, but the HARP, they, the, the Congress says you can't make this HARP where you're up in the sky sending nanobots to start fires in fucking California you know, or there's this great new movie about 
you know, Agent Orange versus the people. They these people burned down this this activists and dissidents houses and killed all her four children. And, you know, um, so that they could have the right to just dump and start fires. And, and my boyfriend, he's like, oh, why would they do that? I mean, we our government wouldn't do that. And uh, God knows they do it. You know, look and just look around. That's what okay. they do. That's the new world order. They put, okay, they Ellen, we got to put them in jail. OK, but I, I, I let you go a couple extra minutes. All right. Thanks, Tim. No problem. Now, who's next? Vicky, Bob. Mike. Uh, Bob, you might. You, Charlie, you want to go real quick? All right, I'll go. All right. OK, so, first of all, let's thank our speaker. Uh, I usually go last, but uh, for a very informative uh, presentation covering a, a number of uh, current topics. I'll be eclectic as usual. First of all, regarding Bob, uh, there's a concept known as the inherent functions of government. And you can toss that around. What is an inherent function of government? In 1971, the nation was turning into a garbage dump when they established the EPA. Uh, he says, just go to the courts. I don't think you could find one company that was responsible for the 50 super fund sites like Love Canal that you could take to the courts. So I don't know what process he's alluding to. Now, next issue, um, there's some issues about, oh, not raising minimum wage. During the 10-year period, at least, that the decade that minimum wages were frozen across the nation, the salaries of the CEOs increased 385%, I believe. Um, but that didn't harm the economy, I guess. Uh, or the increase the cost of the potatoes. Um, I think the only harmful effect of increasing the minimum wage is that certain individuals were not able to take their families on vacation to Disneyland, the owners of the companies, as they were accustomed to doing. Okay, regarding ballot access, uh, you have to keep in mind that the political parties um, all of them have the same criteria for getting on the ballot, for the most part, except for incumbents, of course. I won't get into that. And it was explained to me many years ago while I was out in December and January collecting signatures for a party that the intention was to keep out the lightweights. Um, you could argue whether or not that's legitimate or not. Um, you know, I... I remember years ago I met the Green Party in Illinois, and we decided to run Ralph Nader for president. And I still remember there were five of us, and I said, well, that means we only need to get 12,000 signatures each within the next 30 days in order to get them on the ballot. But we were able to do so. I don't. So you can do it if you have the mind with all and the intelligence to pursue these things. Um Let's see. Now, the other thing that kind of bothers me a little bit is the last election, I collected over a thousand signatures for the Green Party to get their candidates on the ballot. They even came over to my house to pick up my petitions. But then again, we have people that do nothing for the Green Party. And from what I heard, they should be picking who the candidates are and who we have to campaign for and use the resources of the party to help get elected. And there's got to be some sort of process to ascertain who those are. I it put forward a lot of personal effort, and I don't know if it denies somebody the right to decide who the, par the candidates are of the party. I, I don't know if they can claim any such right. Regarding Hillary, a little bit about Hillary and Biden. Um, you know, they, the thing is, is regarding the the big campaigns are, I heard something about education. Well, there's issues that come to the surface in each of these campaigns. Um, you got to look at the candidates' experience. Uh, you know, I like Hillary. Uh, she had served in, as an elected official in the U.S. Congress. She had been chief of, she operated 
one of the largest government, most complex agencies of the government, you know. Uh, so, uh, I mean, she did have some experience in this regard. Um, Biden as well, so for 47 years in the U.S. Congress, and his record was there. He voted 100% for organized labor here. Um, anyhow, they, there are lists that come up of, of, prime, of issues in these campaigns. Um, and amazingly enough, I was asking and inquiring of the libertarians what their list was of primary, or their primary concerns, like in the upcoming election, and they didn't have one. I guess they just run on doctrine every year, a, a set of old-fashioned doctrines, and figure that's sufficient. I guess that's their approach, but they apparently didn't have any issues uh, in the campaign, but... Anyhow, thank you very much. Come again when you got another one in you. And we appreciate your speaking. Thank you. It's very interesting. Okay. Um, who's next? I'll go next, Tim. Okay. Uh, yeah, six okay. minutes, Bob, and we can okay. get a little time. Go ahead. So, uh, okay. Well, uh, thanks uh, for your presentation tonight. Uh, I do need to clear up a little bit of confusion you have about uh, a couple things. Uh, let's see. The 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 difference between a republic and a democracy so a republic just means that the power is placed in the hands of the people um uh, and not it's not a monarchy not a heredit not a hereditary uh system or anything like that and so in democracy is a form of government that the republic makes possible of course, in democracies, I guess you'd say commonly, you know, the, you know, one man, one vote, or essentially, you know, mob rule, if you want to, you know, take it to its extremes. Um, the other thing is about the Second Amendment. Um, you know, the 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 when they when they, the right to bear arms. You know, they were what they had in mind was arms that the typical infantry man had at the time. And that's why we still have assault rifles today. We have the right to have assault rifles because those are the typical, you know, weapon the issue, the weapon issued to your infantry man. That's what everybody needs to be able to have because we are also, besides our, for our protecting ourselves, we also need to be able to organize a militia and repel a tyrannical government. So, uh, that's why, you know, so nobody's asking for, you know, bazookas or tanks. It doesn't mean you can have a nuclear weapon. It means you can have the equivalent weapon of what an infantryman has at, at the time. And this has been upheld by the Supreme Court. Uh, there was a case in, in the 30s. I forgot the name of it now, but basically it was a couple of mobsters got pulled over in a car. One of them had a sawed-off shotgun, and he was claiming uh, that it was his Second Amendment rights to have it. And the government said no, not you can't have that. We can regulate type of weapon. That's that's not the type of uh, arm you know issued to a to an infantry man. So you can't have that. Does that include my loony neighbor? Well, you know, there's there's a registration process. Uh, you know, that you shouldn't. You know, if if you have loony problems, uh, you know, you should not be getting a gun. But uh, well, he does. <laughs> But of course, sometimes now you know. Then Looney got a stockpile. There's, there's finish. Yeah, there's a you know what what you know we need to maybe have a whole uh, another topic some night just on, on the Second Amendment. But uh, now I want to talk about a real threat to democracy that I became aware of this week. And if you go to YouTube and uh, look up uh, some of uh, Tucker Carlson's broadcasts, he did one about the uh, Biden taking the. Uh, the illegal immigrants, they're pouring over the border now to the tune of like 180,000 a month. And they were putting them on buses. They were just quietly putting them on buses and then sending them to various cities in the United States. Well, then that was drawing attention of journalists. So now they're taking them to uh, an Air Force base and they're secretly flying them out to different cities to escape the prying eyes of the press and the uh colonel in charge of that air force base 
drafted a letter and sent it out to everybody and told all the you know all the enlisted men and everybody else not to take any photographs and not to talk to anybody or tell anybody about the flights but somebody leaked this letter out and Tucker Carlson had a copy of it he's got the colonel's name the whole bit it's all right out out there in the open but what do you think where do you think they're putting these people now this is a, so far about a million people that have been, been that have been taken at the border these are just the ones they've caught and then instead of sending them back, they're they're putting them around the country. And where do you think they're putting them? In swing states, wherever <laughs> wherever they need to shore up Democratic votes, that's where they're going. Now, a million people that's that's bigger than the than the city of Indianapolis. That's how many people are coming in here, you know, flooding the country illegally. Now that is changing, you know, the democracy. I mean, that is really circumventing, I think, the democracy because nobody, none of the None of the voters here, or you know, nobody. There was nothing, nothing on the ballot about wanting to allow this kind of behavior or anything like that. Nobody asked the people who already lived here or anything else. Now, the funny thing is, the uh, somebody uh, from the Biden administration was on TV the other night, uh, talking, war giving a stern warning to any of <laughs> the Cubans, any of the Cubans that are trying to escape, you know, that would like to leave. And come to the United States, and he was telling them to do not come here. The Coast Guard will intercept you and send you back. So it's like the Biden has a completely different Biden administration has a completely different tune when the uh, incoming uh, immigrants are you know tend to be Republicans, uh, like the Cubans are. That's kind of kind of interesting. They take such a hardline stance, but uh, but yet uh, they're allowing. Uh, all these other ones to pour in through the through the southern border and then you know they're uh, secretly placing them in in swing states getting ready for you know fast tracking uh, fast track to citizenship so in other words all these you know in, in, in the democrats eyes all these illegal immigrants coming in at the uh, uh, coming in from the southern border they're not illegal immigrants they're simply unregistered democrats Okay, and that's, I guess that's about it. Okay, uh, who's next? Joseph, do you want to say something? You're, you're, you're unmuted, Joseph. Oh, thank you, Tim. <clears throat> uh, well, uh, rebuttal. Uh, I, I would like to applaud the professor here. Uh, Hypernationalism, uh, swaying from the spirit of constitution. Um, Correction uh, and change at uh, the local level uh, and your uh, stylish Costco glasses. These are the things I applaud. Amen. <clears throat> As a rebuttal, I would say it starts with your saying that U.S. is a mixed economy. And by definition, uh, for capitalism, the systems and uh, manufacturing and production should be owned by private entities to be capitalism. And in the United States, the government doesn't hold any of them, nada. So by definition itself, this is a capitalism, not a mixed economy. <clears throat> On the contrary, I would go to the extent of saying that this is the mecca of capitalism and there is a rampant, uncontrolled capitalism. Uh, democracy has been circumcised or considerably diffused. Capital is sitting at the throne not the democracy per se. With the globalization, the uh, tentacles of um, American capitalism uh, is spreading all over the world. Literally, capitalism is destroying social fabric of older civilizations like India where people lived peacefully and harmoniously for thousands of years. 
now individualism and your competition consumerism materialism and greed are on the throne so i submit to you that the monster of capitalism is the culprit uh, which is at the root of the ethical downfall you are talking about that's about it back to you tim all right any uh, michael or uh, the other ellen did you want to say anything or vicky nobody uh, michael do you want to say anything no not right now no how about you, Vicky? It was a very good presentation, uh, Bonnie Jean. Vicky, how about you? Anything? No, I enjoyed the presentation, but I don't really have anything to say. All right, I'm going to go maybe two minutes here. Maybe I'll, I'll take as much time as I may consume, but it will be under six minutes. <laughs> um, the one thing I have to say about our election system, you know, we do have uh, other examples of... Uh, numerous parties vying for power in, in other countries and it's called the parliamentary system all you have to do is look at great britain and see what they do now they only have a campaign of about six weeks each and every party gets two minutes on the national airwaves as well as some other things but they can also actively campaign but it's limited to about a six-week period um i don't know exactly what it's going to be with our election reforms, but I do know that America has been based on political parties. It was the Whigs, it was the Federalists. And at the time of the election of Abraham Lincoln, they had something called the Know Nothing Party and four political parties that were active. Um, there have been times of trouble in the past, but we've always seemed to have gotten through it. And my own saying on it is that our democracy is working and it's in a, in a way just fine. We have polarization in the Congress, I know that, but you know, people are eventually deciding. We got rid of a, what I call a president that had some dictatorial tendencies and replaced him with somebody else who I think is a little bit more reasonable, though I don't think his new D, Green New Deal stuff's gonna go through, but it is nice to see government back in with policy discussions instead of the uh, drama that we're getting at coming out of the White House for quite a while. I am seeing that the 2016 elect, 2020 election was probably one of the cleanest we had in history because it's also been one of the most examined in history. And I think that uh, able to achieve the peaceful transition of power, the dedication of people who run elections has been pretty damn good. And that, you know, I take a lot of pride in living in the United States. I don't think it's such a horrible place to live. Um, I'm proud of being American. I'm proud to live in the suburbs here in the country. I'm glad we have free speech in the Constitution. And we largely appear to it because I don't think in a lot of other countries we would have been able to have this kind of forum, at least without, you know, some kind of some kind of a thing. I'm also proud to be a member of an organization called Toastmasters International that has helped me develop some public speaking skills and helped me moderate quite a bit here. Um, Bonnie Jean, I applaud you for coming on this forum. I wish more of my Toastmasters friends would make use of it because I'm sure you had some fun and some whatever. That is the end of my rebuttal. Um, thank you, Bonnie, for talking tonight. Now. Is there anybody else that has a rebuttal or shall we let Bonnie Jean have the last word? All right, seeing none, Bonnie Jean, the floor is yours. We have at least 10 more minutes. And if Kim? You longer. Yes, Charlie. Could I just say one thing quickly? Go right ahead, Charlie. The problem experienced, and I mean, going back many, many years, was not denying people access to the ballot so much. And, we had ballot access was finding good candidates. Yep. There was a real problem with the green party. I mean that the feet on the ground candidates. And the, um, the other thing is a lot of people don't realize this when you're on these criteria committees, I personally look at, have they put together a viable campaign? Yep. If the individual hasn't put together a viable campaign, 
I've got to wonder how serious they are about running for office. But if you look at that, and you find they've done nothing in that regard, um, it's got to be some understanding that you have to put forth some effort in order if you really are genuinely intended uh, on running for office and doing some good for the people. Thank you. Okay. Bonnie Jean, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tim and others. Um, interesting thoughts tonight. I want to contend that I, I never meant to imply that there isn't a broken economy and that the problems with raising the wealthy's income doesn't also cause as much problems as in raising the minimum wage. Reality is we have a broken economy. We have a broken democracy as indicated in this lovely cartoon here. Our broken nation is struggling and together as a nation, we need to come back and look at where we want to go as a nation. I have always been proud myself to be a be an American now at the point in my life where I don't know if I feel that same proud, excited aspect of Americanism that I always have felt. Right down to when people ask me my race or ethnicity, I always say I'm an American, no more, no less, because that is very important to be rooted in that national heritage that I have had more than 400 years of my ancestors in. As a nation, looking back at our history and re-examining our foundational documents and really understanding what we're supposed to be and where the problems came about for locking us in to a place where we feel as though we don't have freedom to speak our minds our opinions, it's heated. Life is full of passion and we should be passionate. And we should be passionate about what we believe in every single day. And we should have a nation that allows us to speak those passions, to speak those truths as we understand them and to respect each other for that. Our constitution gives us the power to have a nation for the people, by the people, of the people. And that's what I've always wanted. That's, that's what I've always believed in. And right now, I don't see it happening. I see a nation riddled with corruption where money is the power and the sole expression of everything. Leaving the poor and the hungry out on the streets and I would like to see open dialogue, communication, and bridges built so that we can, as a nation, heal and put the puzzle back together as one people meant, <laughs> meant for a perfect union instead of imperfect, whatever this has become. Tim, the floor remains yours. <laughs> All right, at this point, we're going to close out the college. I'm going to officially end the meeting. I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Again, I'll keep the Zoom call open for the next little while so we can get things going. So 